Hi students, for today's notes, I'm gonna change things up just a little bit. I thought maybe you would wanna see my pretty face and hear my wonderful voice. Um, thus far, we've looked a little bit at the 1950s through some notes and then documentary around the presidency and the years of Dwight Eisenhower. Then we got into the 1960s. In the 60s, we divided into two different presidents. The early part of the 1960s were John Kennedy, a little bit more youthful and optimistic. Then with Kennedy's assassination, we moved into the middle part of the 1960s, the Johnson years. I'm here today to try screencast to see if maybe this is a little bit more helpful for some of you to be able to follow along. You'll also see in Google Classroom some uh, an outline graphic organizer of some notes. So for today, we're going to review a little bit uh, and then we're going to go over Richard Nixon. So we're still very much in the mood and the tone of the 1960s, even if chronologically we move into the 70s. And the last thing that I want to do today is just kind of cover a little bit of grading and see how people are doing because we haven't had a whole lot of interaction. So we're going to review. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about Richard Nixon and hopefully get down some notes. And then just as an overview, kind of see how everybody's doing and talk a little bit about grades and such. So I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I hope that by adding my voice here, it doesn't make things worse. So I'm going to try to go into presentation mode and start with a little bit of a review. So distance learning, hopefully this quarantine thing is okay. I hope your families are safe and I hope that you are healthy. Uh, we're gonna start with just a little review here of the 1950s. So if I said 1950s and I was to give you the choice of four different words, which would you pick? My hope right now is you'd be able to connect to some of this vocabulary and even connect some names and places and concept and events to the decades that we've already studied. It should probably look something like this. The 1950s were conservative, and there was a real pressure from society for conformity. The 1960s, because people were discontent, because they were not happy, they were pushing for change. Now, the truth is there was some of that discontent and change going back to the 1950s, but we didn't tend to pay as much attention to it. It was a little bit less underneath the surface a little bit more underneath the surface, rather. So when we think of the 50s, stereotypically, we think of the end of World War II, the tremendous economic boom, really just a miracle in terms of changing from a wartime economy to a peaceful economy. We think of people moving out to the suburbs. We think of baby boomers now having their first families. A nuclear family is the two parents and two kids at home. And we think a little bit about the Cold War. Now, World War II is over, but the competition with the Soviet Union has increased. For the 1960s, maybe not everyone is as happy as we pretend in the 1950s. Groups like women, African Americans, and young teenagers. For the 60s, we have the start, the confusing beginning of the war in Vietnam. We have baby boomers who are born in, let's say, 1948, who become teenagers in the 1960s. In 1965, they'd be 17 and would be questioning their parents. You also have the start of the civil rights movement. Going back to the 1950s, you have Eisenhower and you have Levittown. Levittown is an example of the suburban houses. People really wanted to move out to the suburbs to take the highway system. And a lot of the houses looked the same. It's a good metaphor for the conformity of the 1950s. In the 1960s, now we have Kennedy on the left, young and dynamic, and Johnson on the right. The Johnson years actually see the greatest liberal changes as he signs into law some of the civil rights acts that people were protesting against. You also have the beginning of the protest movement, the wider anti-Vietnam and free speech movement. Dr. Martin Luther King is found in both decades. In the 1950s, the civil rights movement is starting in small southern states and towns. In the 1960s, the civil rights movement moves to a national stage. The picture that I have here for you to associate with the 60s is Martin Luther King's March on Washington, D.C. Outline for this week. Uh, today, I'm going to try this, and please give me feedback and let me know if the screencast helps. Maybe some of you have already turned off the volume of my voice. Tuesday and Wednesday, we'll look at a documentary. I'm trying to give you two days to look at the video, about 45 minutes, so you could do it either day. Whoops, sorry. And uh, it will all be around Nixon. Thursday, I'll have a little bit of vote notes. We'll, we'll change significantly what we're thinking from the Nixon years to the Carter years. And then you'll have the weekend to not necessarily do a whole lot.
There's a typing mistake there I just noticed for the Carter years. Let's change this together. 1976 to 1980. I hope everyone is doing okay. Uh, this is the first screencast that I've tried, and I hope that it's working for you. So now let's get into the years of Richard Nixon. Nixon is a well-known politician. He's a senator right after World War II, as a World War II veteran, he kind of stakes his reputation on being anti-communist, the way a lot of people were at this time. He's the vice president under Eisenhower in the 50s, and he runs for president in 1960. Maybe you remember from an earlier documentary, the 1960 election is the first where the debate was on television. Kennedy, the Democratic candidate, looked young and confident. Nixon, even though they were about the same age, looked a little older, looked a little bit more nervous. Kennedy was really good for television. Nixon probably didn't have as much success on television. You could joke that Nixon had a good face for radio. Nixon was successful, however, as a politician. Sometimes today people like to just look at the negatives of Richard Nixon. The end of his presidency is kind of a public embarrassment with Watergate. But he was successful because he won two elections in 1968 and 1972. So how did he win? Nixon was really good at something we're increasingly seeing today. This divisiveness of two different sides of the political spectrum can be called, small n, Nixonian. Nixon set up this us versus them. The us were his followers. He called them the silent majority. They were middle class, blue collar, patriotic Americans, even if they had some questions, they trusted their government and they followed what their government said in regards to things like the war in Vietnam. Nixon could make the villains out of the other side, the them he called the long hairs, the protesters, the students, the liberals, the upper class, the intellectuals. And so through this us and them politics, obviously American society became more divided. Nixon's side was about law and order, was about the police and nationalism and the military, far more conservative. So in the Nixon years, at least for his presidency and the quiet, silent majority, we see a little bit of a pendulum shift back to a conservative way of thinking. In reality, we can't really say the Nixon years are conservative or liberal because it's a mix of both, but he was certainly conservative. In 1968, the election, the first election that Nixon won, I'll remind you that the video that we saw just a couple days ago talked about all of the fighting in Chicago. The Democratic Party was really divided, and Nixon in the us versus them divisiveness politics really pulled together the Republican Party. He's president from 68 to 74. So what about Nixon in Vietnam? Looking at these two elections, in 1968, his campaign promise is peace with honor. He says, we'll get out of the war, but we'll do it in a way that makes Americans proud of being Americans. We're not going to just pack up and leave. We'll continue to fight. We'll win the war. We'll keep the South from becoming a communist country. How does he do this? Well, in 1968, 1969, at the time that Nixon is elected, the draft is really unpopular and increasingly protested against. So Nixon and the government at the time starts to change the draft and maybe perhaps make it a little bit more fair and actually decrease the number of troops that are going to be drafted, the number of young men that are going to be drafted. If he decreased the number of troops, but he wanted to win the war, how could he do this? So Nixon told everyone that we're slowly pulling out of Vietnam, but actually increased the bombing. More of his strategy was towards the heavy carpet bombing in things like Operation Linebacker, where he would attack the North, but have less fighting in the South, where less soldiers would be needed and less soldiers would be killed. To look at a graphic here for a second, is the number of troops in Vietnam. And you can see almost a perfect bell curve, the height of the war in 1968, and Nixon starts to withdraw troops, starts to decrease the draft. However, keep in mind, he's not ending the war. He actually wants to, I think at one point they quote him as, and he says, bomb the North Vietnamese to the negotiation table. In 1972, we're still involved in the war and the strategy changes to what's called Vietnamization. Now Nixon says, vote for me. I've got a new plan. 
we're going to hand over the fighting to the South Vietnamese. And so the argument at that point is all about training the people of South Vietnam to defend themselves against communism. Again, if you look at the graphic, you can see that we're really decreasing the number of troops and therefore the protest against the draft has also decreased. Now, when Nixon is decreasing troops and saying that he's getting the United States out of the war, in some ways, we're actually escalating the war. We move into the neighboring territory of Cambodia to fight against the Vietnamese. So on the left at the bottom, it says expanded the war, meaning we take the war into neutral territories. I'll show you a, a map in a second. And, and it's less about the strategy here. I think most people probably would have gone ahead and, and accepted that we needed to fight in neighboring Cambodia. But it's the fact that Nixon kind of lied to the people. He said, no, 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 we're getting out of the war. But in reality, we were increasing. it. So the map on the right hand side shows Vietnam in kind of the pinkish, orangish color. And then you see the neighboring countries of Laos and Cambodia. Those arrows coming down from the north are the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This is why the Viet Cong was so successful. This is how the North were able to support the South. They ran supplies, food, and weapons through the neighboring countries. So Nixon and many of his advisors thought, well, we need to bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We need to stop this support. So he extended the war by fighting against the people that were in the neighboring countries of Cambodia and Laos. But he told the American people that we're actually getting out of the war. Well, how do we know the truth? On the bottom left, you see journalists. This is a very young Dan Rather. American journalists, the new baby boomer generation, were less trustful of the government, and they started interviewing soldiers. Now we're able to have live reports or reports via satellite that only took four or five hours to transfer back. And so the journalists would interview people, and they would actually physically go into Cambodia and see the actions. We start to see a wedge divided between what the government is saying and what some people back at home are thinking. Nixon and other politics, again, like I said, you have to look at the positives and the negatives. Nixon usually gets taught in high school classes only through the bad things towards the end, but there are some positives. Today, the fact that China is trading so much with international countries and companies around the world has to partially be a result of Nixon, quote unquote, opening China. Nixon thought that by going to China and starting to sort of be friends a little bit with China, it would hurt the Soviet Union. If the United States is not having success in the Cold War, maybe one way to tackle it would be lessen the power of the Soviet Union by starting negotiations and trade with China. So Nixon opens up China for the very first time. He physically goes to China. Those of you that are fans of Forrest Gump will remember ping pong diplomacy. That's not a made up thing. We start to send some athletes, ping pong players, people back and forth with China. And in the early part of the 1970s, this begins to open up and change China. By the 1990s, China will still be a communist government, but economically, they'll start trading with other places. Another positive in Nixon and politics, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. We have the first Earth Day and the society as a whole starts considering the negative impact of industrialization and laws about clean water and pollution come about. Another positive, salt, S-A-L-T, not the uh, thing that you would put at your kitchen table, but the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. So Nixon, again, if we're losing in Vietnam, he's trying to win the Cold War in other places. And this is a limitation on nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union also signs. So we decrease some of our nuclear weapons and we get the Soviet Union to decrease them as well. On the other side, oh, there's Nixon. Sorry, I forgot. There's Nixon with, do you recognize who he's with? That's Ho Chi Minh. On the other side, the divisiveness of America at the time, the limitations, the pendulum of liberalism and change and discontent of the 1960s in regards to having support from the government now has shifted. And some of the changes that we were looking at in the 1960s are going to be stopped. Lastly, of course, is the important issue of Watergate. And that really is the end of kind of Nixon's politics. And that upsets a lot of people. So we'll spend some time talking about Watergate. First and foremost, this is Watergate. It's a building. Most students don't ever know the fact that it is this great, horrible 1970s style architectural building. If you get to Washington, D.C., you can take great tours of the Watergate building and they explain all the things that I'm going through here. 
So the building's important because it's the headquarters for the Democrats in 1972. The Democratic Party, the opposite party of Nixon, he was a Republican, are trying to stage a campaign. They're planning for what um, they can do to try to win the 1972 election. Well, Nixon, maybe, or some of his followers, maybe, or some of the people around him, we don't know for sure, but there are Republicans or there are Nixon followers who want to know what the Democrats know. So basically, they put wiretaps into their phones and they bug the Democratic headquarters in the building of Watergate. And the problem with this is they get caught. There are some pretty low level criminals, not Nixon. Later, they're called the plumbers because they're supposed to stop the leaks. These guys get um, arrested. They get caught going in and out of the um, Democratic headquarters of the Watergate building. If we were in class, I could show you kind of a little bit of how they got caught, but basically an old technique of taping a locked door um, so that you could come back during the evening and break back in. They taped a lock and they left it taped. Anyway, they got caught. We're not 100% sure today. Historians don't know exactly the direct connection between these guys breaking into the Democratic headquarters and the President Nixon, but Nixon denies everything from here forward. And most people feel like he either knew a little bit about the break-in or he participated in the cover-up. So there are journalists who did not like Nixon. This is Woodward and Bernstein, Carl Woodward and uh, Bernstein. I can't think of Bernstein's name right now. I'm sorry. Um, Woodward and Bernstein work for the Washington Post, and they think that there's trouble here. And they really stay on this. 18 months, 22 months, they continue to try to make a connection between this illegal but minor break-in and uh, President Nixon. They're trying to figure out who is paying these guys, and do they have any connections to donated money for the um, campaign to reelect Nixon. Nixon. It's Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, I think are the two names. So Nixon, um, in order to uh, get the heat away from him and say he has nothing to do with this, he starts um, firing a whole bunch of officials, uh, people that are around him, lawyers and other go people in government positions and things like that. And as he fires more and more people, the Senate gets a little bit uh, curious. Let's hold on to that cartoon for a second. The Senate is like, well, why is he firing all of these people? In one particular Senate investigation, and I think the guy's name is Butterfield, he's appearing in front of the Senate in one of these official hearings where you're sworn in, and if you don't tell the truth, you'll get perjured. If a journalist comes in and asks you questions, you, you don't have to answer them. But if you're in front of the Senate, you have to answer. So one of these officials who was fired by Nixon is appearing at a Senate investigation. And he says, I'm not really sure, but why don't you check the tapes? And the Senate says, what? Check the tapes. We learned as an American public through Watergate that there was a recording system inside of the White House in the Oval Office. Nixon didn't put it in. On the graphic on the right, the little blue dots show you places where there are recording devices. It was probably put in by Kennedy. Kennedy was trying to record a lot of what he was doing. He was an author. He was a writer. He supposedly wanted to write his biography. Johnson kept the exact same recording devices and used it the same way that Nixon did. He would record conversations from time to time. If you're really bored, you can go to the presidential library in Austin. It's all digital. You don't have to physically go there and look up all of the Johnson tapes. He, he says hilarious things. And Johnson lets the tape record for a long period of time. He really doesn't do it the same way that Nixon does. Nixon does it to record what's, what's happening. And so when this guy Butterfield is in front of the Senate and he says, check the tapes, now the Senate says, whoa, hold on. If Nixon kept track of all of this, then we would have definitive evidence or proof we would have on these tapes whether Nixon was ordering the break-in or more likely paying people off as a cover-up. The Nixon tapes become a huge public debate. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says, Nixon, you have to turn over the tapes. Well, at one point, they turn over some tapes, but they're clearly edited. And by now, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, have become pretty frustrated. The Supreme Court says Nixon has to turn over the tapes, and he resigns. He is never impeached. Keep in mind, impeached means just 
charged with a crime. Nixon is never impeached by the House. He resigns before that happens. So as a whole, the Watergate investigation really um, mars the Nixon presidency and embarrasses a lot of people that the president of the United States is involved in these things. I'll take you back to the earlier notes. Nixon does some good things or some positives. Historians feel like the EPA and China are some um, significant contributions in American history, but he's going to be known mostly for this Watergate scandal. Nixon resigns. Um, the, the vice president, Spiro Agnew, actually resigns before he does for a whole nother investigation. We can get into that uh, corruption on a different scale. So the Speaker of the House, Gerald Ford, becomes the vice president when the vice president resigns, and then he becomes the president when Nixon resigns. So Gerald Ford will be the president for about two years. I want to lastly conclude with some, some summary statements. Um, I know you've gotten some emails from Dr. Kaczewski and a little bit of communication from me. If you look into power schools, you'll see that I am recording that students are completing their work. I know everybody's in a different situation and home right now can be very stressful. And some of you may have to watch uh, younger siblings or have other responsibilities. We've been asked to not have grades count against students. We've also been asked in power schools to not have the current grades count towards the final semester. Truth be told, right now, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. But when you submit your notes today through Google Classroom, I, I am keeping track. Um, in, in, in power schools, about once a week, I'll post a grade that's kind of a summary of all of the information. If it's a day late, no problem. If you get a little bit behind, no problem whatsoever. But I would encourage you to look at the feedback that I'm giving you on those notes. I'll ask a question or I'll make a point or I'll give you a compliment or something like that. So don't just submit, but take some time to go back maybe over some prior assignments and look over those. At this point, the official kind of grading policy is that the work that you do during this quarantine, during this distant learning time can only help your grade. So these will improve your grades as we move forward. The last comment I want to make, and then I'll let you go, is kind of big picture where we're going. I started kind of hopefully easy in the 1950s and the 1960s with some notes and some, some videos, what I thought were some kind of interesting documentaries. Maybe you disagree. We want to provide the context, the background that's necessary to understand this time period. So we're going to continue today with Nixon and later with Carter. In the next week and a half, you'll have a hopefully a pretty solid background on the 50s, 60s, and 70s. I'll give you a little take-home test, take-home assessment to make sure that you can match the words with the time periods and the presidents with the events, etc. Then once we get through that context, once we get through that background and everybody knows the 50s, 60s, and 70s and what they're about, then we're going to return to our inquiry projects. Before break, I asked you to consider something that you would want to learn. Rather than coming back and diving into that right away, I want to provide the background, give you the context so that you understand some of these names and some of these dates and these time periods. Then if we're still in this situation, what looks like we probably will be, rather than continuing every day with lecture notes and with video, you'll get a chance to kind of take it a week or two and dive into something that you want to learn. So I'll obviously pass on a lot more information about that as we go further. For now, I hope everyone is well. I'm going to try to figure out how I can stop this recording, but uh, it's good to see you. Please feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, if there's anything that I can help you with. Uh, I hope by appearing here today, and if nothing else, you laughing at my terrible face, that, uh, that you will have a good uh, week at home. Stay safe.